pieces for. The bottom two shelves are the books I've written in various editions, uh, editions for certain years and editions for certain languages. Uh, that uh, Native American arrow up there, that was from a Native American guy I briefly had a group of in Galena, Illinois. This is my schedule here. Um, the the coloured, well, pretty much every, everything that's written on that is, is a foreign trip somewhere. Early in the year I was in Turkey and Finland a couple of times and uh, Prime Minister Island, Bertie Ahern. How long ago would that have been? A couple of years ago, I suppose. Which edition is that? What does it say on the front? Has it got to... It says 2006 inside. Let me look at the front there. Yeah, that's the most up-to-date version. And you have actually some uh, changes still. Between the original uh, fifth edition, that, that's the kind of Fifth edition Mark II. <laughs> I'm very proud of that book. I'm proud of lots of things I've done, but you know, I'm, I'm, I guess you should be proud, proud of everything because if you're not proud of it, you, you, know, you guess you're fucked up. But um, it's uh, that yeah. book has, has begun to develop almost the quality of a novel, really, because I just said it's more like a textbook, actually. The feel, well, of it, the heft of it. <laughs> well, that's true, but um, you know, it starts off. I now have the intro bit where I'm in the Netherlands and getting very bored with Heineken. And uh, I, somebody says, go down to the Catholic provinces in the south, there's more small breweries there. And they also have um, like a sort of pre lenten carnival. So, and the year that, that that happened, John Lennon was in bed with Yoko Ono in the Amsterdam Hilton. Yellow Submarine was top of the charts. And uh, the, the prime minister of the Netherlands was yeah. Yellow. J-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. So there was a satirical political song called Yellow Submarine. And down in the carnival, the pre-Lenten carnival, they're all, sing all singing this. And you know, they wear costumes, or they're all wearing John Lennon face masks. So this guy wearing a John Lennon face mask, he gave me this dark brown beer, and I drank it, and wow, it was strong, and bam, you know. And he, he looked at me and said, did you like that? I sure did, yeah. He said, if you like that, you're in the wrong country. What do you want to do? To, just, just take a bus from the town square, go south. In two kilometers, you'll be in Belgium. And I knew nothing about Belgium back then. So I took the bus and, uh, you know, it changed my life. One weekend in Belgium, Changed my life, so I made that. That's the that's like the sort of prequel to the book now. And um, there's a chapter later on, toward the end of the book, where I'm in Colorado, and there's a new brewery opened in um, um, one of the mountain resorts. Um, what was that? Breckenridge, Myra Breckenridge, <laughs> Breckenridge, Colorado. They, they just opened the first. Breckenridge Brew Pub, and uh, somebody's going to take me up there to take a look at it. A guy called Jeff Labesh. We're driving up into the mountains. We cross the Continental Divide, and there's like a, a place where you can have a sandwich and drink and take pictures and stuff. And Jeff gets this bottle out of his trunk of his car. It's a Chimay bottle. Oh, I said, okay, that's all right. He said, uh, oh, it's not Chimay. It's my home brew. Just you know, the Chimay bottle resealable is okay, so. We had this beer, and he said, you know, Michael, I want to discuss something with you. Um, I love Belgian beer. What do you think about the idea of a brewery in America making Belgian beer? I'd like to start a microbrewery specialising in Belgian beer. I said to him, Jeff, great idea, but it's too soon. Don't even think about it. Forget it. Well, of course, he opened it. It became the, still, I think, the fastest growing brewery 
in the United States. New Belgium. So he he, uh, he he sensibly ignored my advice. I always get pissed at people like ignoring my advice because <laughs> <laughs> he's not sensible to ignore it. So that makes a nice this sort of bookend to the story, you know. I do a lot of editorial thinking about my my books, you know, because I've been a magazine editor, been a newspaper editor, I've edited a TV chat show. A TV chat show. I, yeah. the program. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was the editor of for a time. And, um, yeah, so I've done a lot of stuff and I, I bring the, uh, sometimes when I feel I'm maybe sort of uh, using a sledgehammer to crack peanuts, but um, sometimes I bring my experience in other fields of other areas of media, bring them to bear in um, what I do in writing about drink. Well, you've been writing for years and years and years. And well, I've been writing since about 14. Yeah. Um, I was um, I was at, sort of high school when I had my first stuff published. Um, in fact, my first, the first thing I published was... In, in a high school publication or in some... Well, the first thing was in a high school publication because the first thing I published was there's a report of a rugby league game written in classical ancient Latin uh, in the, the rhythm of iambic pentameter with some rather Sephardian linguistic jokes in it. Um, and that won the award for the, um, the best writing of that year. And uh, somebody said to me, you know, you do this stuff for a living. I said, what, write, write, write reports of rugby league games in <laughs> classical land? He said, no, but you could, you, could do, you could be a journalist, you know. And I said, well, okay, that solves that then. So I'll be, a, I'll be a journalist. And uh, I started sending bits to the local paper. So everybody who died in this town got an obituary in the local paper. Not a death announcement, but a story about them. So you'd go to the, the widow, very often she said that the coffin would still be in the front room. She said, would you like a look at him, love? This <laughs> is a slightly sort of off-putting beginning to one's career. And uh, <laughs> uh, so he said, well, um, yes, thank you. Um, so, so tell me, um, Mrs. O'Connor, um, you've always lived in uh, Soothill. Yes, and uh, your husband too. Yes, uh, so um, I'm guessing that you um, you went to, you went to St Joseph's Church. Yes. So your husband was he an altar boy when he was a lad? Um, no. Um, what well, St Joseph's Church has a good rugby league team. Did he, did he play for the team? No. Did he support the team? No. <laughs> did he support um, uh, Dewsbury or, or Batley? No. Uh, well, he he worked at um, Shawcross Colliery. Did he? Um, did he? Was he in the brass band there? No. Was he in the choir? No. Uh, was he? Um, was he active in the, in the trade union? No. Was he active in the Labour Party? No. Um, is that a pigeon loft out there? Was he keep pigeons? No. He's <laughs> getting desperate now, and I said, I "See, you've got a dog in the corner there." What's his name? It's Rover. What breed is he? He's a mongrel. He's half um, half lab and half retriever. And so did uh, your husband, was he in the habit of taking the dog out for a walk? Oh, he went to about nine o'clock every night. You could set your clock by him. And he went up to, I think he went up to the pub actually. I think it was just an excuse to go to the pub. Which pub did he go to? The King's Head. So I'd go up to the King's Head and I'd Ask the landlord if he knew this fellow. He was a bit vague about it, you know. <laughs> uh, one of the customers say, "Oh, it's that bloke who comes in and and sits, sits there for has one pint for ten minutes and says now." See, <laughs> so I said, "So he doesn't say anything." Well, you know, he keeps himself to himself. He once made a joke about the weather, and uh, so then you get back to the office and you say, uh, "You know, the, um, the regulars at the Rose and Crown in uh, Slavinsky Street." Well, this week morning, their friend, Harry O'Connor. Uh, you know, he, uh, yes, he used to be, you set your clock by him. He'd come in here every night at nine o'clock with, uh, with his dog, you know, his nice uh, half lab, half retriever. 
And uh, so was he good company. Oh, I he had a very good joke about the weather one time. <laughs> so I once said rather pompously that you know, if people didn't have a life, I gave them a life. That was a very pompous, silly thing to say, but uh, I can be pompous at times. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very good training, you know, uh, in, uh, in having, I mean, my, um, one of my competitors in Britain, Roger Pratz, has written some very nice things about me, and um, in one of his pieces he wrote about my having uh, an eye for detail, and uh, that's you, if you allow that to writing obituaries for people who did nothing with their lives. One thing I really appreciate about what you do is that you're always working for accuracy, and uh, well, like I, a lawyer. I, I, I make goofs like anybody else does, but well, I certainly try not to. Yeah. That, that's a, a journalist sort of uh, thing, not, not a lawyer's kind of thing, but... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there are, um, in the world of drinks writers, there are, there are drinks writers who came somewhere from the drinks industry, and there are, there are drinks writers who came from journalism, and I'm, I'm very much one who came from journalism. I've never left journalism. I mean, I was at a family funeral the other day, and uh, I met this woman, and she said, um, oh, I used to be a journalist, I'm an ex-journalist. I said, there's no such thing as an ex-journalist. A recovering journalist, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, but an ex-journalist. You can't be, if you've got the printer's ink in your blood, it's, uh, it's there to stay. Is it also partly being a bit of an amateur anthropologist or something, when you're a journalist? If you're a journalist, you know, you can be a private detective one day, uh, nailing somebody who's, you know, blowing the whistle on somebody, be McLaren Starrow the next day. You, know, you can be Hemingway one day, you can be a stand-up comedian the next day. And you have your license to do all this stuff. Your license to stick your nose into other people's business, which everybody loves doing. I mean, in my first year in journalism, uh, I was stabbed with a bread knife, uh, beaten up, um, had a few similar sort of casualties. Where you were born was it a small town in Yorkshire, or were you? In... Uh, well, I was I, I was born in a, in a big town uh, by European standards, Leeds. Leeds is a very Jewish city. Lots of Lithuanians and Poles live there, and um, my, my grandparents were from Lithuania. When I was pretty young, we moved to the next town, which is a smaller town. I mean, it was... Today, the move would be nothing, but it was like, say, going from Boston to... Um, what's it called? Is it like, Lowell? Or... Yeah, like Lowell, Massachusetts. <laughs> I think it reminds me of Huddersfield, where I grew up. Reminds me most of Lowell, Massachusetts, and it was a similar distance from Leeds that slow was, is from Boston. But, you know, it's um, culturally very different. For one thing, there were no Jews in Huddersfield. There were plenty of um, Poles, but they're all Catholics. And uh, my dad used to send me to the, the Polish deli to get rye bread. And uh, when you got there, these pictures of Jesus with um, Steve Martin and everything, you know, quite scary. <laughs> You know, the, the only bit of um, sort of excitement colour I'd ever had in the synagogue was when my my grandfather had to blow the, the chauffeur horn once, you know, blow down the walls of Jericho. It was a, it was a big deal. He's going to blow his horn, you know, the ram's horn. But uh, the Catholics had all this... I had this friend, Timmy O'Brien, who was always telling me about purgatory and limbo and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and my mother said, you know, who told you? I was telling my mother very earnestly about limbo and purgatory and the difference between them. I said, who told you that stuff? I said, Timmy O'Brien. She went to Timmy O'Brien's mum and gave him a yeah, hell, you know. Don't you fill my boy's brain with all this, all this um, <laughs> religious unpleasantness. <laughs> <laughs> but your mother wasn't Jewish. No, she wasn't, no. She was, um, Which technically means that you're not Jewish. Well, yeah, it's, um, try, try telling that to Hitler. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, perhaps it's wrong to, to give Hitler the casting vote, but, um, you know, I, I, if, uh, if the Cossacks come to Hammersmith, 
which incidentally they have come, but they're mainly just delivering pizzas. But um, it's the Cossacks come and sack the village. I'm out of here, you know, I'm not going to wait to <laughs> say, oh, no, it's quite all right, my, my, my mother was an Anglo. That's fine. Okay, good. I'm fine, carry on. You know, I mean, it doesn't work wouldn't well. it work very well on Crystal Nut, I don't think. So, um, I'm not taking any chances. Your father's name was... We don't, we don't really know. I mean, my dad called himself Jackson. He, he, he and his brothers, uh, during the war, he didn't want to be going around with a, you know, a long foreign name of any description. But it seems like I saw something in one of your books. Well, I, I, your I took a it. spelling that was in, in, you know, immigrants who come from a bad place, they don't want to talk about the bad place. They're left for a good reason. You know, and uh, I used to try and talk to him and it's like, you know, you know, you're, you're the one who was who mother's a shiksa, you know, and, and uh, why do you want to know all this stuff anyway? I'll tell you what he'd say, you should be really proud, I should be proud of what of? Your, your, your great-grandfather was the Lord Mayor of Moscow. Well, he obviously wasn't. This is just his, so go away and shut up, you see. And one day he gave me um, this big greasy manila envelope. So if you, look, if, don't ask me any more questions, just look through this envelope and when you finish looking through it, bring it back to me. Uh, there was every document from his life in there. There was his um, joining the British Army, being discharged from the Army, uh, being fined for cruelty to his horse, uh, being, uh, getting married, all of the stuff, you know, and every one of these documents had a different name on it. It's, it's the Ellis Island thing, you know, I mean, uh, if they hadn't been Jewish people, if they hadn't been immigrants, um, probably they wouldn't have been able to read anyway, you know, because people of that age and uh, back background couldn't read and write anyway. But some guy asked him, you know, what's your name? He says what his name is, and the guy is, can't quite figure it out, writes down, and Drakovich. And the next one is Starkovich, uh, Jakovovich. You know, they're all different. Every every document has a different name on it. And uh, I mean, that's how most Americans got their names. Well, maybe not most, but you know, a great many. If you're black, you, they call it Michael Jackson because um, <laughs> you know, it's a uh, <laughs> it's Andrew Jackson, and uh, or it's a slave name or whatever, or it's not a slave name. So. Um, in, in this country, it's, it's very much the same. It's, um, it's, it was always difficult for me when I first spent a lot of time in America. The Americans would talk to me about um, you know, Britain, where they have cups of tea all the time. Pe Americans are very nice people, very generous, very kind, very hospitable. They keep saying, would you like a cup of tea? No thanks. Uh, I'll have a coffee if you don't mind. Are you sure you wouldn't like some tea? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look, I don't want any goddamn tea. <laughs> I don't drink tea. <laughs> I, I, I don't uh, take a break in the middle of the afternoon for tea. And yes, I know you drive on the other side. I, I, I've noticed. Uh, actually, I'm so confused, I can't remember what side anybody drives on. You don't uh, drive? No. Have you ever driven? I had, a, I had a, a motor scooter when I was a teenager. I used to drink a lot. I got picked up by the police and very drunk and astonishingly uh, they, they didn't prosecute me. And that same week, two buddies of mine were killed, yeah, drunk and driving, so I said I wasn't going to drink and drive. So I haven't driven since. You chose drinking over driving? Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Um, Good choice. Not that they ever drank very much. I, mean, I drank a great deal when I was in my teens and early twenties, but after that, you know, I just, um, I've never drunk very much. I, I just love, I love the stuff the taste of it. I don't really like being being drunk. When you talk about liking to the taste of things uh, but not like being drunk, does that inform what you what you like to do? Do you like beers that aren't too strong? I like strong beers too, but I'm interested in the the, the taste more than anything else. The overall um, the overall package I'm interested in, but you know, it's I mean Drink is about taste, I always thought. I could never understand it when people, um, well, 
Um, I guess there's something here about it. So. Um, Beer, if... If you can't taste it, um, why bother, I think it says. Oh, got a bit lost in my... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I folded yeah, my ample. I straightened it out. But at some point, you began to write about drinking. and But not just drinking, but, but good things to drink. And yeah, I tried on, on the local paper, local weekly, and uh, I did manage to do a series with one of the other reporters we were friends. Uh, we collaborated on the series. I went to the editor, I said to the editor, I've got this great idea, you know, he said, oh, oh yes, what's, what, what's that, lad? I said, I would like to write a, a series called, um, This Is Your Pub. He said, Jackson boy, how old are you? Sixteen, sir. You're old enough to go in pubs, aren't you? Yeah, we, we're the, the, the newspaper of this town, we, we deal with the police, we, we deal with the council, and you're asking me, uh, you're asking me to, to give you the money to buy a drink with us, but yes, sir. Um, so you're asking me to finance you on a law-breaking escapade. I said, um, yes, he said, I like your style. That's the kind of, <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of reporters we want. So, so uh, we did this series and uh, there are about 50, rest, 50 pubs in the town and 50 weeks in a year. And uh, then he called me and said, you know, I, I thought you've, I have some doubts about this series, but it's, it's done very well. People would, they'd buy six copies, you know, to send one to their, um, their auntie who'd um, emigrated to Winnipeg and uh, another one to their, their son-in-law who was working in um, Arkansas, you know, and uh, somebody else who'd uh, moved to Australia. They'd send them copies of the paper with pictures of them in their local pub. So he said, uh, well, I'd like you to know, I've got another idea for you. I'd like you to um, do a piece on, this is your church. So um, I moved to a bigger paper at that point. <laughs> <laughs> but, but did you find interest in all those pubs? Oh, yeah, it's no problem, you know. Um, and it wasn't obviously just the beer. I mean, uh, I imagine those days, uh, well, maybe not, but uh, it was... They were tight houses that didn't have much. Yeah, well, people they, didn't all talk. The people didn't talk about the beers. That was the thing. Um, and did, did you avoid that entirely, or did you just talk about the the life of the? Well, pub I, I was very interested in, in why the beers all tasted different, and ales do tend to taste have, have bigger differences than lagers too. Um, There's a wider range in, in ales. Well, the, the, the top fermenting yeasts, you know, um, leaves more flavours in the beer, so. Because there are more flavours, you can never have a wider range of differences, even if they're just a, a standard products. And, um, yeah, I mean, people talked about beer, but they, it was, you know, oh, I was in, I had to go to that uh, coal mine disaster in Barnsley, I had some Barnsley Bitter. That's great beer. No, no, you don't drink that stuff. You know, the Leeds and the Tetley's, that's really good beer. Oh, no, no, no. Bradford, Hayes beer, Obi Joyful from Blackburn, great beer. But they just say it was great beer, you know, it was the legends about how strong it was or how dark it was, but nobody knew anything really about beer and the breweries didn't t tell you anything. Certainly nobody talked about uh, flavours of black currant. No, definitely not. No. Kiwi. I attempted to describe flavours, certainly. I, mean, I was the first writer to do that, really. Both beer and whiskey. But for, but for beer, yeah. Not, yeah. obviously wine, people were doing that. Yes, right, but I was the first person to do it for beer. But that's kind of what I want to get at. It seems to me that you may have been the first person to treat beer as a serious discipline. If well, you know. I mean, the camera did it for, for British beer, but um, in my feeling was this is a very good thing that they're doing, but um, what about beers in other countries? What about... Uh, Threatened traditions there in other countries, and so I really made much more of an effort to try to, first of all, to try to map the beers of the world, and then to try to distinguish them from each other. And you know, I occasionally get um, a bad rap for people say I, I, I invented certain styles; they just didn't exist. Um, Saison didn't exist. You invented it. You imagined it. Mm. Well, 
I didn't. There were a few people nosing around doing odd bits on beer, and I read something that somebody had written about um, Berlin of Ice Beer, and he said it tasted like his Aunt, Aunt Mary's uh, cider, you know, celery wine or something. And I thought, well, yeah, maybe it did if, if you thought that, that all beer should taste like bud. When you had a Berlin of Ice Beer, it might taste like um, celery wine. What you have to understand is it's not meant to taste like bud. Um, so I would try to say what this beer should taste like. And then, of course, people say, you say you're being, uh, you're being a beer fascist or something. But it didn't say at first because nobody ever really attempted to say what beer should taste like. And that's what I was trying to do with beer. I was trying to say, well, it doesn't have to all taste like bud. And uh, the, the only alternative to bud isn't Guinness. There are all sorts of things out there. But uh, they won't be out there much longer if we don't uh, take some interest in them. Now, I got a bad rap from um, Camera some years ago uh, for writing uh, in, in, in The Independent, which is a national newspaper, and uh, I wrote a piece about um, lesser beers. Mm -hmm. Now, I, not in, I didn't say they were great beers, certainly not, but I said they were a bit more interesting than, than Stella Arthur, for example. And, and at the end of this piece, I had a little box story saying, if you, if you try leather beers and you like them, maybe you should um, try some Trappist beers. You know, here, here are the half dozen brewers and hear what they make, and just a little, little box story. Um, so people say, you know, why, why do you write about leather? Because there's a whole bunch of people, you suddenly get it widely, a whole bunch of people who have never gone anywhere beyond beyond Stella, and they might be persuadable to drink leather, and once they do that, they, they've broken the, 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 the prison of, um, it has to be golden lager, and uh, I do give them information where to go next, if they, if they want to. I'll hold my head up high and stand by my record, and the people can come and uh, smack my face for writing about some not such interesting products, but it's made it possible for me to write about some very interesting products. And it's always been hard to, you know, right from the beginning, I mean, it was, you want to write about what? Lambic, what's that? No. Michael Brood beer, you ever been smoking dope again, Michael? We published that piece you wrote about some, some jazz head who's got some weird pub somewhere in a cinder block building in a dangerous part of town. You know, so um, do us a favour, write something about, at least mention Heineken in your stories. Do you think at this point that people in general are ready to move ahead and, and hear about more obscure things well, as they are with wine, moving, for example? You know, I mean, there's, um, some people are moving from Stella to Leffer, some people are moving from Leffer to Orval, some people are moving from Orval to, um, uh, you know, the the two guys who uh, made that beer called Bitter. Nino yeah. and, and yeah, yeah, right, yeah. XX Bitter, yeah. I can't just go out to spend my whole life telling people ab about some great new beer from Belgium. I've done a lot of that. I, haven't, I won't stop doing it. I'll still do it, but um, I need to write other stuff. If people get on my case about what I should be writing about and stuff, I, say, I look up there, you know, I wrote all those books. I think I've... Uh, I paid my dues. I don't really feel accountable to anybody. Um, and I'm still, I still, still piss people off from time to time. Um, probably more than ever because I, you know, I say, uh, all of a sudden they say something quite, quite uh, mean to <laughs> somebody who's pissed me off, and uh, it's. Um, I never was, uh, I never was quite the, um, well, the cuddly. Um, uh, putting out that people sometimes repeated me as uh, there was uh, always some uh, some needles inside that that uh, soft oh, soil. Well. <laughs> it's not my responsibility to you know to carry the whole show like this. Um, and I'm my writing has always evolved, always developed, and uh, I'm writing much more stuff now about uh, people and about um, my family and about. Uh, um, political issues and so forth. 
not not in conventional political journalism, but uh, you know, I mean, uh, who's going to who's going to say to me, "Well done, Michael Jensen, for persuading an intellectual foodie magazine in Italy to run a story about rugby league." <laughs> <laughs> that's my greatest achievement of, of recent years, and that's um, uh, that story and there's a number of others that, that they've run in the slow food in Italy. Uh, they're they're part of what will eventually be a novel, and it, it's uh, it'll look at a lot of um, social and political issues in a. I hope in a. I'm making it sound boring, aren't I? No, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it'll be a little bit. I hope people will find it interesting. Um, that sounds a feeble, or stupid thing to say. I hope people will find it interesting. I'm getting tired now. But yeah. I mean, not not sort of tired, wrecked, but just uh, t t tired. I need some uh, pierogies and some some beetroot. I was golf. about to say uh, maybe it's yeah. time to walk down the street. I just feel like I, I gabble and mumble and uh, you know I don't. Um, it doesn't make it easy for people to understand. I write the way I write, and at this point, people can take it or leave it. I love writing. I really love it. It's a great job. Okay, we're we all ready to rock and roll. My uh, alleged heart attack in, in Denver. Um, probably wasn't the wisest thing to do, but. Well, um, how has uh, the Parkinson's progressed? Have, have you. Has it been worse in the recent months? Or? I think it has, yeah. I think it is getting worse. But the, um, my, my doctors are very. Um, take the opposite view. I mean, they. they um, it's quite interesting, you know, people, I mean, you know how you sort of feel in yourself and, you know, things that you're very unhappy about or worried about. Then she had this um, nurse called Pauline. She, you know, she's a specialist. This is not my house cleaner, Pauline, is it? Not Pauline. She's a specialist in Parkinson's. And um, she said to me, and she said, you say that you're getting worse. She said, you've been sitting in this hospital bed, hammering at that keyboard, all day long, and you must have written about 2,000 words. You know, she said, when I first knew you, you couldn't really, uh, you're having increasing difficulty operating a keyboard. Well, that's, uh, what she said, as I realized, that, uh, that both those statements were true. The more Paddy and I talk about it, the more I think that what well, a long time I must have had it without probably really realized, you know. I mean, it was diagnosed 10 years ago. You mentioned uh, you were thinking about doing something about Having Parkinson's? I uh, definitely want to do that, yeah. Hmm. I, I want to do a book called I Am Not Drunk. That's a pretty catchy title, I guess yeah. you would say. No. Uh, yeah, so you've, you've actually had people pointing out to you that, that they thought, wow, this, this yeah. guy is. Yeah, and uh, I know a lot of people were saying it, but, you know, I was wondering whether I was. Had a problem or not? So I think it's a, it's a very good title, and uh, um, yeah, I, I think, think so. <laughs> I write it with a bit of humour, you see, and, which is um, not an easy trick to write a book about an acid disease with some humour. But you see, it's, I can do that. You know, it's ten years. Well, it's ten years since I diagnosed it. I think I've had it more like twenty years, really. I didn't want people to, you know, think, well, I can't do any work because you might not, not deliver it, you know. But the word was going around that I had a problem. But not the problem you actually have. No, no, that's right, yeah. <laughs> you can see my very much like that. I mean, I can have you know, slurred speech and staggering around a lot. It can be a bit of a problem like hailing a taxi in London, you know, because if they think you're drunk, 
Then they think, oh, we don't want any trouble with this guy. And sometimes I'm just standing on the sidewalk, I hail a cab, and I, I know I'm rocking about a bit, you know? Was it that, um, those things getting back to you that caused you to finally want to say, you know, yeah, I, mean, I, was, I have I was, this problem? I was visibly ill at the Great American last year, too. Um, It's strange, you see, because one minute I could not walk, next minute I could run. So, um, I was signing books and I was, um, if I want to go, need to go and take a leak, I don't want to be people trying to get me to sign their books, I'm going to take a leak, you know, so I had a guy from uh, the beer club was escorting me to the John. The one time I went to John and suddenly my legs go. He almost has to carry me back. I'm looking dreadful. And um, see Bermond and um, Tom Daldorf were there. They see this, see me looking like I'm about to die, you know. Um, take some more pills. Half an hour later I'm fine. <laughs> but they've gone by then probably. Next night I'm in the Falling Rock with Carol and um, I'm feeling good and the guy who owns Falling Rock. Chris Black. Yeah, who I've known since he was down in Austin. Um, he's there and um, there's some jazz playing and there's pots on TV and some good Belgian beers and people are saying how nice it is to see me and I'm feeling great, you know. Very confusing for people. It could seem like you just had a few one night and the next night mm. you're okay, sort of thing, I guess. Well, that, that but the nature of the thing is obviously that it comes and goes and it's worse sometimes. And yeah. It's also hard to, um, I mean, for one thing, the medication keeps changing because your, your body, um, your body very quickly, I mean, this is to be fooled by the medication, but also they keep developing new stuff. And they've been really, very really into, um, because I appear to be a, a good patient. I'm not a good patient about being ill in general at all, but you know, because I'm... Not very patient about being ill. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm terrible about that, but they keep giving me new stuff to try. And that can, I can seem like a different person depending on, yeah, whatever. And, um, that's not really my style because as a Yorkshire I'm sort of quite just decisive and stubborn and you know, clear, clear mind about it, who I am and what I do. Um, so, and those things are a problem. I, I, I over medicated, I mean, uh, when doing the Great American. It's very easy to do that, it's very, very, very tempting if you. If you you're going to be seeing lots of people, you're going to be in a very public situation. It's very tempting to take too much medication. And so just to you know, make sure you know, I'm not going to get in a crash, you know? And it's, of course, these problems if you do that. There are obviously there are other books out there on Parkinson's, but what would be um, distinctive about this one is, first of all, it's a professional writer who has a problem. It's, it's a first-person story, and it has this angle of the fact that I'm a, a drinks writer. If, I, if I'm careful how, how I balance the ingredients, I can I get some of my um, funny stuff in there. I'm not probably be quite, quite painfully honest about things. Yeah. Yes, Nostrovi. Nostrovi. So hi. Frame, roll, roll, closing credits. You know. <laughs> That's right. That's how it was filmed by Michael Jackson.